In this level two presentation, Victoria Ritter covers forge welding via the basket handle fire poker project. This is part one of three. So I am going to talk to you today about forge welding and this nifty little project. This basket handle poker is nothing more than a sneaky way to teach forge welding as it covers three mainstays. The faggot weld, which allows you to create the basket portion of the basket handle, a uh, drop tong weld to allow you to put it onto a longer bar, and then the collar, which I don't know, collars are just fun. I mean, you can add them to the end like this, or you can put them in the middle of a bar, and it's just a, a nifty way to get extra material onto a piece. And before I get going, I'm going to tell you the secret to forge welding. Okay, there's no secret, but the, if there is a secret, and I'm not saying there is, it's practice. And this project with its myriad of welds is a great way to get you practicing. So with that, let's get started. We're gonna start with two quarter inch brown bars cut to 12 inches. And a neat little trick to find the center is to line those up and they need to be even on each end. So the bars need to be the same length, but you've got a mark in the middle and then you take one of them and you flip it. And that flipping now gets you closer to your true center line. And once you have your true center line, rub out these other marks, or when you get to this section, you won't know which line is the right line. So using your soapstone mark as a guide, place your piece over the edge of the anvil and make a line or a mark, a divot, that won't disappear in the fire like your soapstone will. From there, you're going to bend this, bend both bars in half. And when you bend them in half, I want you to keep the divot to one side or the other. Notice it's not facing up and it's not facing down. It needs to be facing in a direction where you can see it as you bend this bar down and then all the way around so that the bars are even and lined up with each other. You can see that little divots here at the top now. And that'll get hit in your, hidden in your weld, so not to worry about that. When you have them all lined up, you're gonna want the open ends of the legs open just a little bit. So one quick smack on the top will accomplish that. And you should end up with something like this. You're gonna take that and bend the other one and then insert them onto each other. And now you are ready to weld them. And these middle pieces are what will become your basket. The first weld that we're gonna do will be for handle placement. I find doing that first helps because now I've got a long handle to hold on to. And if anything's not gonna go great with these particular series of welds, it's that drop tong. So let's just do that first, like let's get that out of the way. Usually one end of these two uh, sides behaves better than the other one. So pick that one to get started. You're also going to need to switch to a pair of half inch V-bit tongs because you went from quarter inch to now half inch, loosely round material. And when you hold on to this piece, hold on so that the tongs grab these open ends or they're gonna flop about a bit and when you go to forge weld and you're not, you're not gonna like that very much. Make sure also that these leg ends are right on top of the bend. They should all line up pretty evenly. You don't want these, uh, uh, hanging out because they'll burn up quicker in the fire. So you want them touching, you want them anchored so that they heat evenly. So let's just watch a quick little video bending that. 
And you'll see here that the Smith's keeping an eye on the, that divot. The legs wobble about so much that it's hard to just watch the ends and thus the need for that divot. Straighten everything out, line them all up. And then insert them into each other from the open ends so that everything's nice and lined up. And those two open legs are resting on the bent portion. And again, make sure that those are touching or they'll get burnt up in the fire. And you're gonna need to switch to those half inch tongs here before we continue. We're now ready to forge weld and we're gonna weld that first weld, um, but let's talk a little bit. Let's do a little theory of forge welding because forge welding is not forging. And I'm going to frame this discussion in the context of how your hammer penetrates the material when you hit it. And there are four of those factors. The first one is what type of metal are we using? And we're using mild steel. And this is important for us to keep in mind because mild steel is gonna be squishier than something that has a little higher carbon content or some other alloys like a tool steel, which is gonna be a little stiffer to work with. Mild steel actually moves pretty easily under your hammer. The second bit is how hot do you need to be when you want to forge weld? Theoretically, you can clean up metal, put it together under a little bit of pressure, uh, no heat, and after a couple of years, it'll weld. We don't wanna take a couple of years, we wanna do it quicker than that. So we're gonna get our metal hot and it's best if it is yellow hot. All the pieces that you're welding together need to be the same temperature and the, Metal should look wet, not dry and crusty. And the other thing to keep in mind, to get something yellow hot, that means your forge needs to be that hot too. So using a coal forge, you should see yellow coals. You don't see yellow coals, you're going to end up doing a couple things. One is you're going to end up waiting a really long time for that to heat up. The other is you're going to tend to dipstick that down into the bottom of the forge. And that section is highly oxygenated. You've got the airflow coming in fresh. So the buildup of scale is going to be accentuated down there. So you really want to avoid that. It also only gets a little short bit of it hot and you want a good length of your piece heated to that yellow temperature. So make sure that your fire is hot enough and then you can get your piece hot enough. Some say that you, if you can no longer see the piece in the fire, it's hot enough. Well, the only way that works is if your fire is hot enough in the first place. And yes, when they both become the same color, that yellow hot heat, you're ready to go. So let's, let's just take a look at a video of what that looks like. You can see we've got nice yellow coals down here. So this is a good hot fire. And yes, there's a piece of metal down in there. And we bring that up and you can see, you can see the flux running around, but you can see how wet this looks. This is a nice yellow heat and it's wet. Where it is cooling, you can start to see the dry crusty bits come up and that will not weld. A dirty piece of metal with this crust on it will not weld. It's the scale forming and it's losing its heat and it won't weld. So that amount of time you have from when that was yellow hot to crust is how much time you have to get your pieces stuck together. And this piece was cooler, it was still in the heat, but it went quickly from wet looking to dry and crusty. 
Now, once it gets, as you say, let's say you've welded something and then you're watching this crust form and you want to keep going because you've got your weld to stick. Once it gets this crusty, your weld is vulnerable and it will, it will fall apart. So make sure that as you continue to work with your piece, you work it at that high temperature, that wet temperature, so that your piece stays welded. Third factor is the strength of the blow. Some people who are unfamiliar with forge welding think that, you know, you need a Hail Mary blow from on high. Like you got to give this all you've got or this thing won't weld. And that actually is not true. That is a forging blow, not a welding blow. You want your weld to take place at an atomic level. I like to think about it as I'm trying to introduce two pieces of metal and I want them to like each other. And I wanna make that a gentle introduction, not a you will like each other and smack them together kind of introduction. So light to moderate blow is in order here. And one way to help you remind yourself of this is you're gonna carefully prepare your pieces to get them ready to weld. And what you don't want is those being knocked out of uh, shape or knocked out of uh, alignment before they're welded or they're just it's just going to blow apart before you even can start to weld something. So not by the force of your hammer, make it a less forceful introduction. And then finally, the fourth factor is where you hit it. And it might seem obvious. Um, you need to hit it. If this is your welding plane, you need to hit it here. And if we look at that, it's roughly perpendicular to the welding plane. I think most of us can intuit that if we hit from the side, that they're just gonna slip past each other, like no welding will take place. So the hit has to come perpendicular. So keep that in mind. I'm gonna get a little bit more into that when I talk about why we need to make a scarf. But we're gonna just start with this faggot weld and our next job, now that we know that we're um, got our hammer penetration factors all lined up and ready to go, the next job is just to align it and tap it before you lose your heat. Um, this means you need to be ready to go. Your anvil should be cleaned off. Your hammer should be either in your hand or where you can quickly grab it. And you want to move calmly. If you move really quickly when you're ready to weld and you see your pieces ready to weld, that can cause its own delays. Like you could knock your hammer on the floor or trip over something because you're moving too quickly. You're not moving confidently and calmly. So it's a slow, thoughtful movement and try not to be frenetic or you know, a little bit wild about it because calm will save you time. The only question left, and I can hear it burning in your minds is, well, what about flux? You didn't mention flux. I'm going to talk about flux. Technically, you don't need to use flux to weld. Um, it is something that helps keep the surface clean for a few seconds. So it's really nothing more than a time saver. I have forge welded without flux, but I do like the extra time that the flux buys me. So Let's talk a little bit about the different kinds of flux. You can see I have three here. What the flux is doing is it's making a glass surface over your piece that is keeping that scale, that crust, high-speed rust at bay long enough for you to stick your two pieces together. Commonly today we use borax, although I have heard that people use sand, um, which I guess that's how you make glass, so it kind of makes sense to me. I've never used sand, but it does sound like a good experiment down the road. The 20 mule team borax will work fine, but don't inhale that dust. It's borax is considered a poison and it can cause organ damage, particularly to the testes, which most of the people in this crowd would be concerned about. So 
Anhydrous borax is cheap and it doesn't float around in the air. Some people let's say that the, you know, having all the water removed helps it helps you somehow. I don't care about that part so much as that it comes in these big crystals that don't float around in the air. So I like that part about it. And then there's specialty fluxes. If you feel like paying a lot of money, you can buy these. And I think, you know, maybe they buy you a couple extra seconds. I find what they really do and, and maybe what flux in general does is it is kind of a shot in the arm. Like it's a little confidence booster. And if I'm having a low confidence day, I'll break out the Iron Mountain. It has some little metal dust in there, which maybe makes a, a more easier weld. I don't know. Um, I've welded with all of these. They all seem to go about the same. So uh, that that's my little, um, I don't know, diatribe on the different kinds of stuff, flux. So caution with the, the kind that floats around in the air and go ahead and pay extra money if that gives you confidence. Like there's nothing wrong with that. All right, so let's get ready to weld. Here is the start of our first forge weld. It needs to be back about an inch to an inch and a quarter back. The location of that blow is perpendicular to the pieces you are welding. The four rods are going to start as a bit of a diamond. So you're going to want to pull that material into square as soon as you are sure of this weld. And you do that by just turning this 45 degrees and use the way these bars are lined up as your top and bottom where they're even or parallel to each other. That becomes your square. Hit these open ends first, turn it all the way around, and then hit that again. And that starts your diamond. So as soon as you're sure of this, turn it into a square position and leave as much material as you can. Don't start forging, just weld this. So the, the order of business here will be you're going to heat the piece to welding temperature. You're going to brush it and then put the flux. If you put the flux on while it's hot, that flux is just going to run down into all the little nooks and crannies, coat everything, make sure that everything's clean and then put that glass coating on it. If you put your flux on when it's cold, the amount of time it takes you to heat that up to welding temperature, you're just going to burn off all of your flux. So don't waste this step. Heat it to welding temperature, brush it to clean off as much as you can, and then put the flux on there and then reheat. And you don't need a ton of flux, just enough to coat the surface and get a little running down into the nooks and crannies. That should only take you a couple seconds. You're then going to reheat it. And once that's at welding temperature, you're going to hit it on top maybe follow one down towards the end, turn it around, do the same thing, only welding back about an inch and a half, uh, an inch to an inch and a quarter. So let's watch that in action. Hitting on top, that open end first, and then turning to square as soon as possible. And you can see here, it's starting to get into a, that square alignment. And that's really all you wanna do at this point. We're going to put a scarf on the end of that here. So no need to really work out all of these edges at this point. Just get it to a loose square at that point. Usually that I do uh, heat it twice or weld twice to make sure that I've got a good uh, weld there. The next step is going to take that piece that we just put the square on the end and welded, put a scarf on there and execute a drop tongue weld, also called a jump weld. You might also heard it called a lap weld. So it is the weld of many names. And 
I want to, again, frame my discussion in these four factors of hammer penetration, particularly the location of the blow. And we already saw that if you want to weld these two pieces together, those hammer blows need to be perpendicular-ish to where the weld is going to be. If you hit from this direction, where my laser pointer is going up and down, it's just a slip plane. Like that's just gonna shear past each other. Nothing will weld. What if I put one lapped over the other? That's the name lap weld. And this is my welding plane right here. And my hammer blows are gonna come from here. Now it sounds like I'm belaboring something that's obvious, but let's look at this a little bit more. I'm 90 degrees to the welding plane, my hammer blows are. If I hit from any other direction, I'm in a shear plane. But what about this edge right here? Is that in a welding plane or is that in a shearing plane? Because it actually being so sharp, straight up and down, it's almost gonna act, it's not gonna almost act, it's going to act like a chisel. Hitting this straight into this bottom piece is gonna cause a crack that you can't recover from at the forge. I mean, you probably MIG welded, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. We're talking about forge welding. So we need to do something to get this into this welding plane, which is why I keep saying ish on the end of perpendicular. I wanna be perpendicular-ish with my hammer blows to my welding plane. And I can accomplish that by putting a slope on the end here. When I get ready to weld these, I'm gonna hit here. And then my hammer is gonna follow this edge down, putting me solidly in a welding plane and you'll end up with a happy little weld. So now we just need to talk about what we know about metal when we hit it. We know that we hit it. When we hit it, it grows wide. It actually grows in all directions, right? So this top piece is going to grow wide. It would be nice if this grew with it, but it doesn't. This top piece will flare out over the top of this. And one way to think about it is that this piece is gonna act like an extension of your anvil and just stay solid. If you did a little thought experiment and we had a bar hanging like nothing was impeding it, there was no anvil in the way, no nothing. And you had the whole bar forging hot and you hit one end of it, you're gonna see a deformity only where you hit it. The rest of this, nothing happens to it. So it's become, in, in a sense, its own anvil. It just, the hammer blow just doesn't penetrate to the point where you affect anything but the part where you're hitting. So to outsmart the metal, which you know we need to do quite a bit, thin this a little bit, bring that toe in. This is a top down view. This is the bottom bar that is your extension of your anvil. This is the top bar that we put the slope on up here on top. If you bring these toes in, when you hit this and trace this, your hammer down this slope to weld it, as this grows wide, it has room to grow and won't leave little wings that will forever plague you in your piece. You won't be able to get those out uh, forging. So that means we're basically saying that your scarf needs to have a three-sided taper at this toe. So we've got a three-sided taper. We know where our hammer blows are coming from. We're gonna hit on top. We're gonna to follow that down. But we also need to think about how much overlap do we need? And I postulate that less is more. I don't want to run the risk of anything getting in the middle here and causing what is already going to be my weakest point to be even weaker. Any kind of debris, anything could get in there and, it, and 
maybe I'd even have a hard time getting it all welding temperature because they both have to be the same temperature. So put a little step, a little shoulder and indices of sorts on each piece so that you know exactly where to line them up and it's a nice short taper. I like to line that indices up with the peak of my taper right here because remember it's a short taper and this will help you easily and quickly see that, line that up and put the two pieces together. And the only other thing you need to do to outsmart the metal is recognize that this bit here is vulnerable to hammer attack, right? You're going to hit here. You're going to follow that down. At some point, your hammer is going to hit this. You've also got a thick bit here. And this out here isn't going to be heated as much. So all of this is subject to scale loss and errant hammer blows. So make it thicker or start with a thicker piece than you ultimately want to begin with. So to construct your scarf, this is basically our order of operations in a nutshell. And I'm gonna show you um, one way to get there, but as I go along, I'll show you a couple other ways to get to this same point of having that neck a little thicker, uh, three-sided taper, and then that indices to help you figure out how you're gonna line those up. So we've got our weld back at most an inch of a and a quarter on our basket, and we've started making it square. And we're just going to put it to the far end of the anvil. This is the, the hammers coming over the top back towards your knees to just start as short as you can a taper. We're trying to preserve as much material as we can. So the shorter the taper, the better off. And just hit it on all four sides, make that, make that uh, taper and hold it flat, knock it down to make it a three-sided taper. And that's what we said we needed, right? A three-sided taper. To make your step, make sure that it's over something with a round edge. It can be the side of your anvil or it can be the block. What we don't want is a shearing plane or a sharp edge in the middle of this. The graphic has a sharp edge. It should really be a soft rounded edge. You're gonna hit it on top, then you're gonna drop your material hand and follow that angle down to reestablish this taper or your welding plane. Making sure your hammer matches that as you hit it. So I said I would show you another option. So another option to get your taper, let's say this end got horribly disfigured in the fire, uh, just cut a little piece of it off with a chisel. And that is another way to start your taper. Then it's just a matter of thinning in the sides and setting your indices in place and tracking that down. And even if this is steep to begin with, that's fine. Cause when you set your shoulder in there and follow this down with your hammer on the end, that'll lengthen that toe out and it'll be a nice, more appropriate taper, less steep. So we've got our welded piece. We're making our four-sided taper. And it's a very short taper. Notice no other part of that is being worked on at all. Put that shoulder over a rounded edge, drop that tong hand, and then just follow that little toe down around. That last little maneuver to put that curve in there is another time or heat saver. It means that when you put this down on the anvil, which this is the piece that'll be on the bottom, the short piece with the tongs for a drop tong weld goes on the bottom. That piece is gonna be subject to the heat sink, also known as an anvil the most. So have as little touching as possible and putting that slight curd in there allows you to just have this peak touching and nothing else. 
stay tuned for part two where victoria picks up with making the scarf for the shaft